but that's that long-term thinking. All right, we are now live. So welcome back. You are in the Vermont House Transportation Committee and it is uh, Thursday, uh, March 18th, 11 o'clock. And we have some guests in today that I'm looking forward to hearing from. And I'm trying to find my list of the names, quite a few. So um, we're going to hear probably for the next hour, an hour and a half um, before lunch, on AOT's equity and inclusion programming. This is a subject that has come up in a variety of ways. How is transportation looking at um, equity in the way that we program, the way that we look at, look at things of mobility? And uh, much like we did with complete streets, it starts to create a, 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 a view of where and how you look at whether it's project or anything that we do. So we've asked for um, uh, Michelle and others to come in and talk to us about that. So welcome all that's in here right now. I think we have definitely our members are, are here. And with that, unless anybody has any questions, why don't we let them get started and introduce yourself as well. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Michelle Boomhauer, I'm the Director of Policy Planning and Intermodal Development for the Agency of Transportation. Uh, we appreciate the introduction and we're very excited to talk to the committee about this topic. Um, here with me today, uh, I have uh, Susanna Davis, who's the Executive Director of Racial Equity and the Chair of the Governor's Task Force on Racial Equity, and she works with the Agency of Administration. And you will also be hearing from Lori Valburn, our Chief of Civil Rights and Labor Compliance, Christine Hetzel, our Organizational Development Director, Wanda Minoli, our Commissioner of Motor Vehicles, Wayne Gamble, our Finance and Administration D Division Director, and Ann Gamble, our Highway Division Director. And um, it's, uh, uh, we have a PowerPoint that we're going to share with you and, um, uh, uh, we're going to start with opening remarks from Susanna talking about things at the state level and how the um, agency will um, be fitting into that framework as well. So with that, Susanna. Thank you, Michelle. Buenos dias, everyone. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director. Um, I'm going to I'm going to try to keep it brief because I think the bulk of what you want to hear is going to come from our AOT friends, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the state level, specifically how we're framing equity um, in a way that makes sense, not only for this agency, but, but statewide. So I'll talk a little bit about how we're incorporating racial equity and really all forms of equity into the strategic planning process, which has um, certainly taken us time, but it, it's worth it, right? Because when we talk about equity, what we see in, in the United States is inequity built into so many of our systems that it seems, it feels inextricably linked to every aspect of our daily lives. And so the remedies have to be inextricably linked to all aspects of our daily lives. And so you can cut up, you know, the approach to racial equity in so many different ways, but the way that I have found useful um, is to look at it in three main buckets. First is how we are as an employer. So what work environment are we creating that makes SOV staff not only feel safe and have proper um, opportunities for advancement and, and protection as employees, but also cultivating a culture and an environment that is equitable. Um, so how we are as an employee, uh, excuse me, an employer, how are our systems set up? And I'll come back to that in a moment. And then third is how we are as a provider of services. So how are we, are we and how are we interacting with the public? And that middle piece, what are our systems like, kind of cuts across the other two because when we think about remedies for inequity, there are different ways you could approach it. You can do sort of adaptive or transformative change that really gets at the core of the issue, or you can just kind of do technical changes, you know, piecemeal things here and there that don't really get at root causes. And so that third bucket of what are our systems like really forces us to ask ourselves, are we making systems change or just technical change? And I'll give you one example of that. Um, if we notice that we are underrepresented in, let's say, staff of color, one easy thing that a lot of organizations will do is say, well, let's just hire a bunch of brown people. Let's get, I don't know, 22 brown people in next year. And sure, you could do that. 
but that's not really getting at what is it about your hiring system and your normal recruitment and retention system that makes the numbers so imbalanced in the first place. So analyzing the way that we traditionally do business rather than just having a one-time workaround is really key to making sure that we're building equity into our work. So that's a major part of the approach that we're, that we're taking at the state. And that's something that we're trying to apply as uniformly as possible across agencies while also allowing for the different nuances of each agency. We know that health policy is different than tax policy. And, and so being able to adapt for the needs of every agency is key. Um, one of the things that's a little bit more unique about AOT is that it has a lot of federal requirements that it has to comply with. And a lot of those federal requirements do have to do with equity. And so we have found that AOT tends to be a little bit further along than other agencies when it comes to certain equity protections, largely because of that need for compliance with federal regulations. So um, a lot of the work that AOT has done around equity is informed by that, and therefore we're excited to be using that as a model for a lot of our other agencies. Things like language access, things like um, close adherence to the Civil Rights Act, which you're gonna hear about, I think, from Lori. Um, so so it's, it's exciting to see that work, um, but we also recognize that we're not done. The thing about AOT is that it is really a culmination of a lot of different types of infrastructure. The spatial infrastructure, the social infrastructure, and the service infrastructure. All of that is wrapped up into AOT, perhaps different than some of our other agencies. And so for that reason, where we live plays a big role in this. So you can't talk about transit without also talking about housing. Where is housing concentrated for different ethnic and other social demographics? Um, how far do people have to commute to work? Do you live in an area that is served by public transit? If not, why not? You can't talk about transit without talking about things like broadband, job opportunities. Where people live and where people go is often shaped by what schools or jobs they need to go to. And so to a large extent, this work really has to lean on other agencies and departments to set up solid systems so that people can not only get to where they need to go on clear, clean, safe roads, but also have reason to be going where they're going um, and ensure that those outcomes are all equitable. Are we putting up super highways in neighborhoods that are disproportionately people of color? Are we putting parks and green spaces in areas that are predominantly affluent or largely white? Are we bulldozing through the ancestral um, cemeteries of indigenous people just because a neighborhood wants a, a shortcut to get to the highway? These are all things that we have to take into consideration. These are all some of the equity issues that we face in transit, not just here, but nationally. The last thing that I wanna add is um, some of the other things that we've done at the statewide level is we've created a network of equity liaisons. That is the sort of point person in every agency or department who's gonna have eyes and ears on equity issues in their department. This is a cohort of people who are gonna come together on a regular basis, um, share strategies, intel, and just, it helps us to identify any emerging trends or patterns that are happening across the agency. Um, it's something that we've been intending to do for a while because I think everyone acknowledges that equity work can't live in one agency or one office or one person. It's got to be um, actively pursued across the enterprise. And for that reason, having people deployed in every agency who are focused on that is really key. Um, and of course, AOC has an entire civil rights division. And you know, so again, they're a little further along than some other agencies, but the equity liaison program is one way that we're building that, that strong net and that network. Uh, another thing that we've done is to mandate the use of EIAs, that's equity impact assessment. And the purpose of the EIA, um, you may have already heard about it and I understand the legislature is creating some form of that itself. Um, it's, essentially a questionnaire that accompanies all budget and policy asks that come from the executive agencies. The purpose of it is to ensure that we're asking ourselves a standard set of questions to determine whether the policy or budget ask that we're proposing is going to create any disparities um, that are foreseeable or unintended. It ensures that the benefits and the burdens of our proposals are being equitably distributed. It helps us with our planning and helps us to um, understand what kinds of provisions we need to build in. I'll give you an example. Um, we have a lot of uh, programs where we say to members of the public, hey, you have seven days to apply, you can apply online. 
And then half the time we say, well, did anybody translate this into Vermont's 10 most commonly spoken languages? And then we say, oh, no, we didn't. And by the time we get it done, the seven days have passed, the application deadline is now passed. And so there's a weird gray area between, are we accepting late applications? It was kind of our fault. So the EIA is one way um, to, to foresee and prevent that because it asks specific questions like, have you consulted members of the community on this proposal? If so, do those members of the community include multilingual people? Are you providing public facing materials? If so, have or will those materials be translated into which languages, why or why not, et cetera. So um, some of those things help us to avoid racial disparities. Another example is our Tobacco 21 legislation, which was recently passed, but does not contain a religious exemption, which has created a racial disparity for Abenaki people, because now minors in that community are unable to possess something that's considered a sacred plant used in rituals like um, purification and conveyance of prayers. If we had used an EIA when we passed that bill, we would have probably discovered that disparity and created a religious exemption similar to what we do with communion wine for minors who are Catholic. So in that way, um, being able to ask ourselves that set of questions and doing so uniformly across the enterprise ensures that our policy making going forward really incorporates equity. I'm gonna stop there. That's a little bit of what we're doing at the broad enterprise level. And I'll, I'll turn it over to our AOT folks um, to speak more specifically about their work. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. It's always a pleasure to hear. And, and I take notes as fast as I can because what you say is so true. So something, you know, we just basically, we don't know what we don't know. And, and um, having somebody that, around to help to point it out is extraordinarily important. Um, uh, I'm gonna still call you Representative Boomhauer. Michelle, would you like to go next? Yeah, so uh, what we're gonna do is we have a PowerPoint presentation and um, I'm gonna drive that and Lori is gonna kick us off. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and I'm gonna go to that. All right, there we go. Thanks very, very much, Michelle. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and the rest of the representatives um, for inviting us in today to talk on this topic. It's near and dear to my heart. My name is Lori Valburn. Um, I had the pleasure of coming in and meeting with you uh, for a presentation a couple of months ago about some of the programming. I serve as the Agency of Transportation Civil Rights Chief. And it's a position I've held for many years, actually since 1997. Um, but so much of everything that we've been doing at AOT, and we have had the additional incentives that Susanna referred to, um, since part of our uh, funding is tied into ensuring that we are compliant with non-discrimination laws, uh, with laws that promote equal employment opportunity, equal economic opportunity, We've tried to really use that not just to check off boxes and, um, and just meet the uh, basics of our federal assurances, but to really breathe some life into it. Um, but it has been a challenge in many instances. Um, we're so grateful to Susanna's uh, leadership and guidance in this area. Right now is a particularly exciting time. We all have um, a, a growing awareness of the impact that the work that we do um, and the decisions that are made uh, in state government, the impact that it has um, on communities and the impact that it has um, on the environment and everything else that we're doing. So being able to um, look at everything through an equity lens, while it's not new to us, uh, we are approaching this with great enthusiasm and we're really excited to be able to start using all of these um, different tools that you'll be hearing about today. I'm going to try to provide some of the historical perspective and the current state of what we're already doing since we have um, fortunately been at this for a long time. So I wanted to start with our Title VI program because it's something that really forms the umbrella for all of our um, civil rights and non-discrimination work that we do. Um, the Civil Rights um, Act of uh, 1964 provided us with um, requirements with respect to ensuring 
that all of the services and benefits that we're uh, providing uh, to state um, within the state of Vermont, uh, not just within our workforce and not just with our subrecipients, but to all Vermonters and everybody who visits our state, um, that we're doing so in a way that is uh, non-discriminatory. And so that is something that we are always trying to take a look at and figure out what does this really mean? Every year, Secretary Flynn um, signs off on uh, a revised policy statement for Title VI. Uh, we provide assurances to our federal funding partners uh, that we're going to um, make sure that we're not engaging in any forms of non-discrimination. But that's a lot um, more complex than it might appear. Um, and so we try to ensure that we're looking at all of the work that we do in all the different parts of our organization through that equity lens. We now have the tool that Susanna referred to, the equity impact assessment tool, which helps guide us through that process. But for many years, we have um, tried to ensure that uh, we are looking at all different parts of our organization. And part of the way that we do that is um, that we have Title VI liaisons. Uh, Right now we have 29 of them. They're sprinkled across our, our organization. They're the ambassadors um, within their workplace, but also in the interactions uh, with the public. And so last year we were able to provide them uh, with some comprehensive training. We're going to revisit that this year as well. We also have um, for many years um, developed and disseminated lots of limited English proficiency uh, resources and links for um, a variety of translation services, whether it's at um, a public participation meeting, uh, the DMV counter, or um, on our website. So um, we're already making progress in this regard, and we know that we've got um, lots of opportunities now uh, to um, actually take it to the next level that you'll be hearing about um, in, a, in a little while. So next slide, please. So I wanted to quickly talk about um, a few and revisit a few of the different programs that uh, we have been implementing uh, with the support, funding, and encouragement of our federal funding partners. Um, I spoke about our Employment Diversity and Highway Construction Program when I visited with you in January. And this is an affirmative action program that is a requirement um, as a condition of our receipt of federal funding from Federal Highway. Um, the whole goal of this program is to ensure that we're removing barriers for um, particularly non-traditional folks, but particularly women and people of color to be able to enter and advance in the highway construction industry. And so over the years, we've been able to uh, use this funding in order to be able to do a very robust uh, recruitment and placement of uh, women and people of color um, in our highway uh, construction workforce, working on projects um, around the state of Vermont um, every single uh, construction season. Many of the people who enter the industry through this program um, have stayed in the industry. They have continued to build careers in advance and um, some of them are now project superintendents they're four men and four women, et cetera. Um, we also use some of the funding in order to provide some other skill-based training as well as CDL training. Uh, it's a particularly effective program. We take a snapshot of this highway construction workforce um, every year um, as part of our um, reporting responsibilities to Federal Highway and the US Department of Labor. And we're able to see and measure the progress, not just in terms of numbers of uh, people that are coming in and diversifying the workforce, but actually are moving up into skilled and semi-skilled positions, as well as leadership positions uh, within the highway construction workforce. So next slide, please. Um, another one of the affirmative action programs that's been uh, particularly successful in helping to ensure equal economic opportunity with the hundreds of millions of dollars um, that we bring into the state each year through transportation is our Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. And it's specifically designed to ensure that um, 
firms that are owned and controlled um, by women and by people of color are going to be able to have um, a level playing field so that they can um, be able to participate on the many contracting and procurement opportunities that um, our agency has as a result of uh, all of the federal funding that we receive. So this is a program that is heavily regulated uh, by US Department of Transportation. Um, it is a um, certification program um, and our um, goal in, in uh, administering the program is not just to uh, get people to uh, sign up for the program and then um, expect that they're on their own. We provide a lot of uh, business development resources, um, networking opportunities, marketing opportunities, um, uh, training opportunities, et cetera. And we collaborate uh, very closely with other federal and, and state agencies uh, to try to really promote uh, women and minority-owned businesses to be successful, particularly in government contracting. Next slide, please. Um, in general, I, I feel very, very grateful that um, we have tried to um, infuse uh, an equity perspective, um, inclusion and diversity into all of the work that we're doing at uh, the Agency of Transportation in many different ways. Um, I think I had uh, indicated when I last met with you that uh, every single state DOT, Department of Transportation, is required to have a civil rights section. Um, and that's been a federal law since the 1970s. Um, some of my counterparts at other state departments of transportation are very, very limited um, in terms of the scope of the work that they do. It's, ex it's um, exclusively focused either on um, external uh, or highway construction industry. And it's something that they're not given the opportunity to actually uh, work um, across the enterprise. Um, here at, uh, in Vermont, I've been very, very fortunate to have strong uh, leadership support to make good use of uh, the team of folks that I get to work with so that we're able to use some of those resources in order to um, already implement a lot of diversity, inclusion, uh, and equity practices within our own um, workforce. So uh, for the last 10 or 11 years, my team has actually spearheaded our hiring and uh, recruitment and onboarding um, process. And being able to mainstream civil rights into those processes, as well as working closely uh, with our training and employee development activities, um, gives us the opportunity to be able to provide our employees uh, with the tools that they need, with the awareness that they need, um, so that we are hopefully um, being a good role model for the rest of state government. Um, we have had the opportunity as well to um, provide training, not just within our internal workforce, but also with our contractors and our other subrecipients, um, including public transits, uh, the towns and municipalities. So next slide, please. Um, some of the different things that we've been doing in order to try to promote um, an inclusive uh, work environment at our agency, and we've seen some wonderful results. Uh, our leadership has supported a very proactive interview and hiring process. Uh, so for example, uh, members of my team or our human resources staff sit on interview panels. Um, we also have been identifying um, as mandatory um, interviews for any eligible candidates um, for groups that have been historically underrepresented in our workforce. Um, and uh, we also have been given the opportunity to serve on or take the lead on a number of different uh, councils, task forces, and teams. Um, that includes um, the Governor's Workforce on Equity and Diversity Council. It includes certain task forces. Um, I think that we have uh, tried to share uh, some of the things that we're doing and the best practices, uh, but also trying to 
uh, create a network so that um, we have an opportunity to explore uh, where there are opportunities for us to be able to start implementing um, new ways and approaches of doing things. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over. Um, I believe, uh, unless there's any questions, um, I wanted to turn things over to Christine Hetzel. Thank you, Lori. I, I do see a hand up, Representative White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if this is an appropriate time to ask a question about the LEP work that you do. Um, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any assessment of the translated materials? Uh, you know, what percentage we have of translated materials compared to what isn't translated at the moment? It's a great question, Representative White. Um, so, and I think that uh, Commissioner Manoli is going to also be speaking to some of the, you know, uh, our DMV has taken the lead on translating a lot of their materials. And um, that's been done in close collaboration with um, the Committee on, um, on Immigrants and Refugees, as well as the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. Um, and so there has been a fair amount of research that's been done on that. And I believe that, you know, we continue to um, use as much data as we can collect, either Census Bureau data or otherwise. We do a fair amount of mapping of um, both limited English proficiency as well as linguistic, linguistically isolated communities. Some of that is in our Title VI plans. Um, mm -hmm. So we're always trying to do the analysis and figure out um, uh, which languages um, are most needed and um, to stay current with that because it's an ever moving target. But I believe Commissioner Manoli is also going to speak to some of that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Representative, Representative McCoy. Do you want to hold uh, questions to the end, Chair? Well, well, if, 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 if it's for Lori or what, what yes. she just presented, it might be appropriate be, so that we don't okay. forget later. Okay, so um, thank you. In uh, one of the slides, you had uh, civil rights training to agencies, contractors, subrecipients, um, public transit, towns, and municipalities. Is, is that training free for those entities? And the second question is, um, is there um, public um, like a PR campaign to let the public transit agencies, towns and municipalities know that this training is available? Those are wonderful questions, Representative McCoy. So thank you. Um, so we all of the training that uh, my team provides is completely free of charge. That's true with respect to all of the training that we've been providing over the years to our contractor workforce every winter. Uh, we provide um, con contractor training um, that's pretty well attended. Uh, this year was no exception. We just had to move it into the virtual space. It actually resulted in even more people attending. Um, so we were glad to be able to offer that as well as uh, recording it for those who couldn't attend. Uh, with respect to the public transits, we've been working with our public transit section uh, to identify the greatest needs and to roll out that training. And so uh, we started just before the pandemic uh, with uh, training um, up in the Northeast Kingdom to RCT. And uh, we delivered three different sessions uh, to that public transit, as well as all the volunteers that worked for that transit. It was really well received. You know, we take, we do evaluations for all of our training because we want it uh, to get the feedback and continuously improve. Uh, so we are going to be hopefully uh, developing and delivering that training in a virtual format uh, to the other public transits. Um, I think that it's really well needed. And that training focused on um, everything from unconscious bias uh, training, workplace civility, and customer service, and with a civil rights um, emphasis on that. Uh, so we're really pleased to be able to provide that training um, and hopefully, um, you know, we have a wonderful public transit section led by Ross McDonald and his team 
they're really responsive and aware of any feedback that comes in from the community. Um, my team gets involved anytime that there's any form of a concern or a complaint that comes um, that's in any way civil rights related. And so um, it's been really helpful when we deliver, when we develop the training for the public transits, we made sure to um, actually work with the public transit team at um, our agency, um, as well as the public transit that we were gonna be delivering to their management to really identify what are some of the issues and the needs that we needed to focus on. So that's what we're hoping to be able to uh, develop and deliver for the rest to the rest of the state as well. So as far as um, towns and municipalities, do you use the various district agent uh, departments? Like uh, I'm in uh, district three. Uh, do you use those individuals to get the information out to the various towns and municipalities that these trainings are available? Do you use uh, Vermont leagues of cities and towns, you know, specific to the towns and municipalities? If this is a free, uh, free of charge program, I, I'm just wondering how towns and municipalities can comply if they don't know the program exists. Sure. I think that um, we need to uh, figure out ways to put, get the word out there. So most of the training that we've helped um, with delivering uh, for to our towns and municipalities has been uh, through our municipal assistance program. Um, it used to be the Municipal Assistance Bureau. Uh, so it's our re the recipients of some of the grants that um, our agency is putting out there. Um, but we also, as you'll be hearing from uh, Christine Hetzel, uh, we have a local roads program. And so we provide training to the towns and municipalities through that as well. And I think that we've been very mindful, uh, particularly in recent years of a compelling need to include um, workplace uh, civility and inclusivity in all of that training. So um, I think that the pandemic has uh, given us a growing awareness of uh, both some barriers as well as some opportunities that we have. And even though this type of training is something that for many years I insisted had to be in-person training because it's behavioral type of awareness, I have, um, I think, been um, won over by the fact that virtual training is something that we're able to deliver to an even larger group of folks and that there are ways to keep people engaged um, in the training and also to report it so that it can be made available to even uh, larger numbers of folks. So that's the direction that we're going in and it's a work in progress. So um, we'll definitely be um, continuing to build on that uh, progress over 2021. Okay, thank you so much, I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you, member. Um, are, you, are we ready to switch to, we're gonna hear from Christine. We have uh, Commissioner Manoli and is there anyone else? I wanna make sure we get it in the time frame. I think uh, that's, yep. Madam Chair, um, everybody that came today has a slide, so we'll try and keep it moving along. Okay, all right, because I think we've got at least until, we'll go probably till noon um, committee. I think we've had some, Good time off. I know that there's a there's a an event at lunch today that actually has Joe Sakali going to that many of us want to make sure we go attend as well. All right, I'm gonna stop talking and let you go. Hello, for the record, my name is Christine Hetzel and I'm the organizational development director for the Agency of Transportation. And so in my role, I oversee the learning and development, technical training, operational health and safety for the Agency of Transportation, as well as oversee municipal training through the Vermont Local Roads Program. And so the VTTC is responsible to create this learning culture of the agency. And Madam Chair, as you were mentioning this morning, when we talk about diversity and inclusivity, we really are all individually, as an organization and as a culture learning, and we need to learn more every day as we evolve in our culture. And it really starts at the top with leadership, with the commitment that our leaders have, not only from a federal requirement, but in their belief system of modeling civility and inclusion. 
We do a lot of manager and supervisor training. There are clear expectations and standards set to create this inclusive environment. And it's really about our entire employee life cycle. As um, Lori had mentioned, starting with the way that we recruit, how we onboard people, every employee, line staff, supervisor, manager in their per annual performance evaluation has these expectations of civility and inclusion, as well as exit interview process in which we're assessing how well did we do? Did the person feel welcomed and comfortable so that we can identify any trends, trends and make course corrections? Next slide, please. I'm gonna go through this quickly. We did testify uh, earlier this year about the, the variety of programs that we offer to employees. One more slide over. Thank you. Um, so we have, Oh, sorry, we're going the other way. It's the second VTTC slide. And it's talking about our programming. We have uh, leadership training, emerging leader training. We um, train people on interviewing and hiring best practices, doing strength-based coaching and development, as well as a lot of individual support in job shadowing, rotation programs, decentralized reallocation. And this is all about making an inclusive environment in which people can be individuals and have individual skill sets and create career pathways. Uh, in addition to the variety of training that we have, we also have other supporting programs, such as the way that we contract with vendors to make sure that they understand our culture of inclusivity, the way that we, in partnership with Lori's team, do competency mapping with interview groups so that we're not just checking a box and we're not just sliding people up the, the, uh, the process, but really thinking about how do we embrace diversity? How do we ensure that the right skill set meets the job requirements and maybe take a little bit broader view, not be quite so cookie cutter in the way that we uh, move people through our system. And then finally, we have strategic workforce committees that feed from our strategic workforce plan that really give employees a chance to kind of share how are we doing, what's working, what's not working, so that we can be much more adaptive. Uh, that was a very quick overview, but in the interest of time, I'll uh, take any questions you may have. Representative Thanks. White. Okay. Representative oh, White. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so. I know in my workplace, we had to pause um, some of these trainings due to um, our former president, Donald Trump's executive order on these styles of implicit bias trainings. I'm wondering if you could speak to if that had an impact on these trainings. I'm gonna go ahead and, and answer the question, but Lori, I'll ask you also to chime in. Um, from my perspective, this is a part of our culture and uh, is, is embedded into every training that we have. There is a civil rights theme in every development and technical and safety training that we have. So um, we did not change. Lori, do you want to correct me at all? <laughs> not a correction at all. You're absolutely right, Christine. And, and in fact, Susanna provided guidance to all state agencies and departments uh, as soon as the original executive order that you're referring to Representative White came out back in September and Susanna kept us informed of the progress of various litigation concerning that right up until the time that the Biden administration was sworn in. And I believe on the very first day of the administration, um, they actually repealed the entire thing. So the guidance that we got uh, from Susanna, we shared with our federal funding partners. And the decision was made that as long as we did not charge any of our time or expenses to any of our federal funds, that we could continue to deliver the exact same uh, training with the exact same content. And that's exactly what we did throughout the fall and into January. So um, it was a huge relief though, to be able to um, see that repealed. And, uh, and we're moving forward. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer that. Sure. Great, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Oh, I, I bet this is Commissioner. I think this is Commissioner Manoli, are you up?
We're not hearing you. I'm having difficulty finding my video and mute button. So good morning, Chair Lamphere and honorable members of the committee. Um, for the record, Wanda Minoli, Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, so there's, I, I will be fairly brief. Um, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is because I've had the opportunity for the past two years um, to share with this committee as we've um, developed many of the items that you see on the slide. And if I could just for a moment go back to um, a point that Susanna talked about when she said we, we have to focus on in the employee, the systems and providers of services. That's our role, that's state government. And I think, uh, I don't think, I think Lori and, and uh, Christine, have really done a great um, presentation talking about the investment um, it, with our employees, our hiring process, our training, um, the culture, the environment that we are trying to create as an agency. And we also talked about systems, um, you know, and I think, and Susanna really brought up the, um, the budget process and, and that policy that we started engaging in. And what I'd like to say to the committee is that um, that's a part of our normal conversation, even though it is not um, been totally official, but we look at our processes and our policies. And, you know, even through the introduction of this in, in the past couple of years, you start asking yourself different operational questions. And so that is embedded into some of the work that we're doing, but her most in the piece that I really want to bring out and you look at the work in the slideshow that's in front of you from DMV, we are a provider of service. We serve every Vermonter in one way or another at some point in their, um, in their life. And um, so in that, I will, you know, you'll, you'll know the work that we did on our website and the translations and the partnership that um, we've done with the Vermont U.S. Committee on Refugees. Um, we have talked about our, our exams and the languages um, and our residency cert certification. So, um, and if we could go to the next slide, um, please. We, we've, we've shared um, our successes with you on all of the, um, uh, the changes that we continue, that we've made in our branch offices and that we continue to do. Um, our roadside interactions, especially with our commercial vehicle operations, um, you know, we have found alternative ways of communicating um, and ensuring that we have interpretive uh, services on the road because that is really very yeah. important. Um, but, you know, our gender neutral option available for driver's licenses and the policies that we've changed mm -hmm. around that um, have been significant. And, um, and also recently, and I look at it as a partnership with Migrant Justice in the last year, we modified our license forms um, to clarify that applicants for a driver privilege card, which is a specific um, license and identification card that was developed in partnership with the legislature are not required to answer questions about citizenship. And just taking and having a conversation and looking at that um, and looking at the application, it was like the first question was all about your citizenship and the driver privilege questions um, where you don't have to prove that you know, we're sort of in smaller font and down below. And um, we just, we adjusted the form and we worked with, you know, Vermonters who um, use the form to uh, just make that clearer. The other point um, I um, into, if I may, Madam Chair, to Representative White's question, um, so I'm going to give you some rough numbers um, and, and I'd be happy to have a follow-up conversation. Um, in, but in the last, um, in 2020, we had um, in specific languages, um, and I'm doing the math very, very quickly for license applications, uh, approximately 200 that were downloaded um, for non-driver, um, excuse me, 250. For non-driver, um, we had approximately 50. 
And, and so, and please remember, even though our book of business is to issue you your driver's license, one of our book of businesses, but we are also your state entity that issues identification. Um, we live in a society that, you know, you have to have a, a um, photo ID. And that's really what the um, non-driver ID is. We are the department that, that provides that service um, to all of your constituents. Um, interestingly, in the last seven days, I'm just quickly going to share with you, I won't get into all of the languages, but I will tell you one, two, three, four, five, six different languages. Um, average is five applications downloaded. Um, and for residency documents, which is a part of your new identification, um, we are looking at about five um, that um, are occurring. The, just to share with you again, um, and that to me, this is a success. In the last 12 months, we've issued, we've had permits. Um, the, the two common, um, we had 201 permits in Spanish, 18 in French. Um, and then we have Arabic and Nepali are um, the other common ones. And one more piece of data, and then I'll answer questions. Um, with um, the use of interpreters uh, for um, road tests, we are um, from when we went live in uh, October of 2020, um, we have had uh, 53, we have 40 tests scheduled, and we had um, uh, 13 with a non-show. And I will tell you right now during COVID, even with our scheduling system, we, have a, we still are seeing a high number of no-shows. And I'm not sure if that's because Vermonters can access um, our services in other ways, or if they've just made a decision because of COVID not to come in and do business in person. Mm -hmm. So I talked very fast and I thank you for the opportunity. Are there questions? Well, I think we, we get um, a good view from, from you, uh, Commissioner, many times during the year. This is, you know, some of the other testimony is now recalling whether it's from our committee or in, in other places, hearing some of the good good work. I see Representative Stebbins, your hand is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to all the presenters. I, I um, it's, It was the best thing ever uh, when I heard Susanna, and Susanna, thank you for all of your incredible work across Vermont. But when I heard you say, actually, AOT is doing pretty well in many ways, um, that that was just super refreshing. It's also really helpful to hear sort of the, the three buckets, um, because I hadn't I, I hadn't been thinking about it as comprehensively. I have a few questions, which is um, uh, and maybe if there are a lot more presenters, I could hold off till later. But one question is, I really see um, I, I, I love seeing the uh, women, the BIPOC, um, you know, the, the language access. Um, the, the other parts to me that are part of the equity conversation in terms of who are we not necessarily thinking about because they aren't at the table all the time are folks who don't have, um, you know, may not have that much money. Um, and then folks who are differently abled. And I think um, I haven't quite heard as much on the differently abled um, and on the economic piece um, through the presentation thus far, maybe you'll touch on it later. Um, and I'll hold the rest of my questions until later. Well, well, thank you. Representative Burke, do you have something quick? I know we've got three, three more if I'm, if I'm counting right. I don't need to, I was, I was going to ask about the, um, uh, the you know, ADA issues uh, as well. So differently abled. So I don't need to ask. Right. Okay. Representative Stevens asked the question. All right. All right. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Michelle here. Um, so um, Directors uh, Gamel, uh, Ann and Wayne, um, had a technical issue at their home. And so they are not going to be able to stay with us. So I'm just going to go through the rest of the slides and then um, 
we'll leave a couple of minutes for questions. I'm hoping we'll answer some of the questions that just arose. So well, um, okay. I did have, I did lose our power in our house yesterday, but luckily uh, not, I got, was able to get it back before floor. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, a few slides on what's next and how we're going to continue to advance. Um, you know, I think we really laid the groundwork on all the great things we're doing. But as Susanna said, there's more that can be done and more that needs to be done. And so, um, you know, we're, we're bringing our story out uh, into the public venue a bit more, uh, communicating with uh, legislative committees. Um, we're going to be expanding our um, equity impact leadership committee uh, to ensure broad uh, participation within our agency, um, engaging with our federal partners, um, both at uh, the US DOT level, but also through our uh, transport DOT transportation networks at the national and uh, New England level um, related to best practices. ASHTO actually um, set a framework for uh, equity and inclusion, which uh, Susanna actually uh, contributed to substantially, and that was adopted this spring by ASHTO, or this winter, I should say, and so we'll be continuing to work at that level. And then uh, working at the uh, state and local level, we talked about providing training for municipalities, uh, working with other state agencies who are working on the spectrum of uh, implementation, and um, and then, um, you know, also working with our consulting community, our regional planning commission partners who are helping us to, um, to plan for projects within communities. And so our engaging the public guidance um, will be um, already includes how we go about uh, enhancing our outreach to folks that are typically underrepresented and to talk about Representative Stebbins' uh, comment, um, we have historically uh, where we know that we have um, folks who might wanna par participate in our public meetings, provided childcare. Um, we try to be very sensitive to when and how we offer uh, our public participation relative to um, uh, multiple opportunities if, if a warranted um, for folks who might be working during the day or in the evening. Um, I think now that we've gone to virtual public participation, we are much more uh, readily able to transmit um, the information out into the community um, in ways that are uh, more accessible. And historically, we've also gone door to door and you know, put flyers on doors so that people who may not have access to the internet know that there's a meeting coming up or translated those notices into different, uh, in different uh, uh, ways. Um, so we're gonna continue that. Um, we're gonna uh, revise our public guidance uh, document, our outreach document. Um, we are going to be um, uh, continuing to adapt our trainings and um, expanding our use of interpreters, as uh, the commissioner pointed out. And then um, what do we do about our projects? You know, uh, it was mentioned earlier that our projects impact uh, everybody in their day-to-day -day life, whether you're driving about and have to get through our construction sites or a project is impacting your community. And so through our uh, project selection and prioritization process, we're gonna have a screening tool um, that will be um, part of what our regional planning commission partners under the transportation planning initiative will be helping to evaluate projects at the very earliest conception stage and making sure that we are um, identifying underrepresented uh, members of our communities who need to be engaged in these projects and making sure we secure their input. And then in later stages, when the projects are going to construction and going to be impacting day-to-day -day activities, we've mentioned a few here on the screen, we're going to be making sure that the outreach that occurs for those communities um, is able to be conducted in an inclusive and um, uh, a way that meets the needs of the, of the folks that are out there. Um, we also will be looking at our uh, future contracts and making sure that our contracting community have been um, you know, made aware of requirements for 
how they communicate with uh, the, the folks that uh, were building projects nearby. And then I believe this is my final slide. Um, so um, in addition to our leadership committee, we'll have a technical advisory committee who will be reviewing all of our policies, procedures, practices, trainings, um, to make sure that we have this equity lens included. Uh, we'll be undertaking an inventory of current and um, uh, equity programs and practices and, and including a gap analysis to understand uh, where and how we need to implement the equity impact assessment tool or a similar type framework um, for all of our efforts. And then we will develop an equity work plan um, as a result of that gap analysis and you know, a dashboard so that we can measure progress and then you know, move forward with the implementation of that equity plan. And that's my last slide. I see uh, Ann and Wayne are back uh, so they can assist with questions if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you. It was really important for us to, to hear this now, especially when, you know, whether it's constituents or, or we're all considering how do, how do we look at the projects themselves. I think the, the agency has, has come light years in the last 10 years uh, around incorporating a lot of this into the uh, actual workplace and development of employees and, and the service perspective of, of, of meeting Vermonters. And now we're starting to see that work plan of like, how do we, how do we couch our lens of the actual projects that we're doing? And I think this yeah. is where training at the municipal level and the regional planning and the tax having them see projects or in, in, a, in, a, in a way that you know, maybe we wouldn't have recognized. Yeah, I think a great, a great example is um, Jen Delabry and I were working on the Amtrak to Burlington project and where's the train gonna be stored. And one of the potential locations was out in the north end of Burlington. And, you know, there was a public meeting and we hired um, a couple of different um, language translators to participate in that meeting with us so that in the event there were questions from those community members that you know we could answer them and so it's you know becoming part of our regular activities that was about 18 months ago excellent wayne and ann did you have anything i know that you had some trouble on your end to, to get through but uh so i just want to apologize to everyone for that i literally watched the bucket truck pull up to the pole next to the house the guy go up and then shut off so <laughs> I went outside and I said, uh, did you just disconnect us? And they said, yeah. And I said, can you get us back on? We're kind of doing something we need to finish. <laughs> so he's, he connected us back up, but I don't know when it's gonna go off again. We'll see. Yeah. Um, and I'm so, I'm sorry about that. I, I, I just wanted everybody to know, and I'm sure Michelle covered it for us, but we are working with all of our federal partners. Our, we have a tri-state group, Maine, New Hampshire, and Maine. We work very closely with them to share local perspectives too. Um, and best practices. Um, we, I don't know if Michelle, you mentioned it, but Susanna helped us on a huge, um, I thought it was a great win for the, for the state of Vermont where um, Ashto was doing a, um, uh, a national resolution and, um, and Susanna was able to write a piece of that and that was adopted into the language that went in front of everybody to vote on and then it was nationally voted in. So that was awesome be part of. So that was a great win for Suzanne and, and AOT, um, as well as the rest of the state. Uh, we're just trying to, to learn as much as we possibly can. There's some agencies that have some knowledge and skills that we don't, so we're meeting with them. Uh, we have some knowledge and skills that some of them don't, so we're sharing what we know. And it's just a, it's a big partnership where we can learn from each other and, and expand and grow. Thank you, and thank you for taking the time. Similar thing happened to me yesterday, too. Power went off, I thought, did we not pay the bill? What? And then three doors down the street, same thing. Can, but, but I was able to get reconnected in time for floor. Let's have Representative Stebbins have a question and then that should end it for lunch. I know that we're, some of us are wanted, we're gonna have to jump over. Some of us are gonna go to that lunch meeting um, that, that other agency people are presenting at. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Chair. And I guess um, I have a few different questions. I mean, I, I think the work you guys are doing is great. The outreach you're doing is great. Um, 
at some point, and maybe I'll just throw all my questions out there and, and hopefully we can resume this conversation after we've got the T-bill passed over the floor. Um, but at some point I'd love to know, you know, how you're working with RPCs um, and how you're also working with, you know, um, Vermont, uh, you know, Vermonters with disabilities, um, you know, with, with uh, you know, sort of the, the folks that might already be talking to the folks that we may not have historically always spoken with. And then, you know, measurements, 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 um, sorry, uh, I would love to know, you know, as we think about next year um, and how do we set goals, like how do we track how we're doing with this? Um, because yep. you guys just presented so much great information um, and it'd be great if, if we could think about how we're seeing that we're going from like zero to a hundred um, and no need to respond because I'll follow up later. And I just want to say, hopefully also um, chair, uh, you know, a, a few of us have been working on, um, you know, some language that perhaps we can talk about for the DMV bill um, with regards to sort of um, having a bigger conversation about what does equity mean and how do we do that um, thoughtfully pertaining to Susanna's systems comment, because mm -hmm. I think the systems part is the hardest part. And no need to respond because it's 1201, but just wanted to throw all that up on the wall. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what, in taking, preparing or looking at some of the things on VTrans's website is fabulous, by the way. And if you get time, which um, I've got their mission, their mission and vision and their strategic goals that I know that you're interested, which they have five of them posted. And, and um, I know that you'd be interested in that representative. Thank you. Thank you all for coming in and um, keeping us informed and, and, and what's going on out there. And the RPCs are a good connection. I know that our, we were talking about that just earlier when we were doing some planning um, that uh, we heard from some people like what is you know, their connection with the towns, especially with some of the money that's maybe gonna be coming in and, and um, how can we help them? So why don't we say goodbye and we're gonna go to lunch and we're on the floor and I doubt we're gonna be able to come back. I think we're going to be pretty much on the floor. Representative McCoy, would that be your take as well? Oh, Kenny. We have we have the three Ed bills up today, so I don't know how long those are going to take. So that, that was where I'm thinking that we're probably going to be on the floor for the rest of the afternoon. And I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>